Hi everyone! This week is about sequence-to-sequence -sequence tasks. We have a lot of them in NLP, but one obvious example would be machine translation. So you have a sequence of words in one language as an input, and you want to produce a sequence of words in some other language as an output. Now, you can think about some other examples. For example, summarization is also a sequence-to-sequence -sequence task, and you can think about it as machine translation, but for one language, monolingual machine translation. Well, we will cover these examples in the end of the week, but now let us start with statistical machine translation and neural machine translation. We will see that actually there are some techniques that are super similar in both these approaches. For example, we will see alignments, word alignments, that we need in statistical machine translation, and then we will see that we have a tension mechanism in neural networks that kind of has similar meaning in these tasks. Okay, so let us begin. And I think there is no need to tell you that machine translation is important. We just know that. So I would better start with two other questions. Two questions that actually we skip a lot in our course and in some other courses, but these are two very important questions to speak about. So one question is data, and another question is evaluation. When you get some real task in your life, some NLP task, usually this is not a model that is a pain. This is usually data and evaluation. So you can have a fancy neural architecture, but if you, have, if you do not have good data, and if you have not settled down how to do evaluation procedure, you are not going to have good results. So first, data. Well, what kind of data do we need for machine translation? We need some parallel corpora, so we need some text in one language, and we need its translation to another language. Where does that come from? So what sources can you think of? Well, one obvious source, well, maybe not so obvious, but one very good source is European Parliament proceedings. So you have there some texts in several languages, maybe 20 languages, and very exact translations of one and the same statements. And this is nice, so you can use that. Some other domain would be movies. So you have subtitles that are translated in many languages. This is nice. Something which is not that useful, but still useful, would be books translations or Wikipedia articles. So, for example, for Wikipedia, you cannot guarantee that you have the same text for two languages. But you can have something similar. For example, some vague translations or just the same topic at least. So we call this corpora comparable, but not parallel. The Opus website has the nice overview of many sources, so please check it out. But I want to discuss something which is not nice, some problems with the data. Actually, we have lots of problems for any data that we have, and what kind of problems happen for machine translation? Well, first, usually the data comes from some specific domain. So imagine you have movie subtitles, and you want to train a system for scientific papers translations. It's not going to work, right? So you need to have some closed domain, or you need to know how to transfer your knowledge from one domain to another domain. This is something to think about. Now, you can have some decent amount of data for some language pairs like English and French or English and German, but probably for some rare language pairs, you have really not a lot of data, and that's a huge problem. Also, you can have noisy and not enough data, and it can be not aligned well. By alignment, I mean you need to know the correspondence between the sentences, or even better, the correspondence between the words in the sentences. And this is luxury, so usually you do not have that, at least for a huge amount of data. Okay, now I think it's clear about the data. So the second thing, evaluation. Well, you can say that we have some parallel data, so why don't we just split it to train and test and have our test set to compare correct translations and those that are produced by our system? But, well, how do you know that the translation is wrong just because it doesn't occur in your reference? You know that the language is so variative, 
So every translator would do some different translations. It means that if your system produces something different, it doesn't mean yet that it is wrong. So, well, there is no nice answer for this question. I mean, this is a problem, yes. One thing that you can do is to have multiple references. So you can have, let's say, five references and compare your system output to all of them. And the other thing is, you should be very careful how do you compare that. So definitely you should not do just exact match, right? You should do something more intelligent. And I'm going to show you blue score, which is known to be very popular measure in machine translation that tries somehow to softly measure whether your system output is somehow similar to the reference translation. Okay, let me show you an example. So you have some reference translation and you have the output of your system and you try to compare them. Well, you remember that we have this nice tool which is called n-grams. So you can compute some unigrams and bigrams and trigrams. Do you have any idea how to use that here? Well, first, we can try to compute some unigram precision. What does it mean? You look into your system output, and here you have six words, six unigrams, and you compute how many of them actually occur in the reference. So the unigram precision score will be four out of six. Now, tell me what would be the bigram score here? Well, the bigram score will be 3 out of 5, because you have 5 bigrams in your system output, and only 3 of them, was sent, sent on, and on Tuesday, occur in the reference. Now, you can proceed, and you can compute 3 gram score and 4 gram score. So, sounds good. Maybe we can just average them and have some measure. Well, we could, but there is one problem here. Well, imagine that the system tries to be super precise. Then it is good for system to output super short sentences, right? So if I'm sure that this unigram should occur, I will just output this and I will not output more. So just to punish and to penalty the model, we can have some brevity score. This brevity penalty says uh, that we should divide the length of the output by the length of the reference. And then, if the system outputs two short sentences, we will get to know that. Now, how do we compute the blue score out of these values? Like this. So, we have some average, so this root is the average of our unigram, bigram, trigram, and fogram scores, and then we multiply this average by the brevity. Okay, now let us speak about how the system actually works. So this is kind of a mandatory slide on machine translation, because kind of any tutorial on machine translation has this, so I decided not to be an exception and show you that. So the idea is like that. We have some source sentence and we want to translate it to get some target sentence. Now, the first thing that we can do is just direct transfer. So we can translate this source sentence word by word and get the target sentence. But well, maybe it's not super good, right? So um, if you have ever studied some foreign language, you know that just by dictionary translations of every word, you usually do not get nice coherent translation. So probably we would better go to some syntactic level. So we do syntax analysis and then we do the transfer and then we generate the target sentence by knowing how it should look like on the syntactic level. Even better, we could try to go to semantic layer, so that first we analyze the source sentence, we understand some meanings of some parts of this sentence, we somehow transfer these meanings to another language, and then we generate some good syntactic structures with good meaning. And our dream, like the best thing that we could ever think of, would be having some interlingua. So by interlingua, we mean some nice representation of the whole source sentence that is enough to generate the whole target sentence.
actually, it is still a dream. So it is still a dream of the translators to have that kind of system, because it sounds so appealing. But neural translation systems somehow have mechanisms that resembles that. And I will show you that in a couple of slides. Okay, so for now I want to show you some brief history of the area. And you know, like any other area, machine translation has some bright and dark periods. So in 1954 there were great expectations. So there was IBM experiments where they translated 60 sentences from Russian to English. And they said, that's easy. We can solve the machine translation task completely in just three or five years. So they tried to work on that and they worked a lot. And after many years, they concluded that actually it's not that easy. And they said, well, machine translation is too expensive and we should not do automatic machine translation system. We should better focus on just some tools that help human translators to provide good quality translations. So, you know, these great expectations and then this disappointment made uh, the area silent for a while. But then, in 1988, IBM researchers proposed word-based machine translation systems. These machine translation systems were rather simple, so we will cover them kind of in this video and in the next video. But these systems were kind of the first working system for machine translation. So this was nice. And then the next important step was phrase-based machine translation systems that were proposed by Philip Cohen in 2003. And this is what probably people mean by statistical machine translation now. You definitely know Google Translate, right? But maybe you haven't heard about Moses. So Moses is the system that allows researchers to build their own machine translation systems. So it allows to train your models and to compare them. So this is a very nice tool for researchers. And it was made available in 2007. Now, the next and obviously very important step here is neural machine translation. It is amazing how fast the neural machine translation systems could go from research papers to production. Usually we have such a big gap between these two things. But in this case, there were just two or three years. So it is amazing that those ideas that were proposed could be implemented and just launched in many companies in 2016. So we have neural machine translations now. Um, you might be wondering what is WMT there. It is the workshop on machine translation, which is kind of the annual competition, the annual event and shared tasks, which means that you can compare your systems there. And it is a very nice venue to compare different systems by different researchers and companies and to see what are the trends of machine translations. And it happens every year. So usually people who do research in this area keep eye on this and this is a very nice thing. This is the slide about Interlingua that I promised to show you. So this is how Google Neural Machine Translation works. And there was actually lots of hype around it, maybe even too much, but still. So the idea is that you train some system on some pair of languages, for example, on English to Japanese and Japanese to English and English to Korean and some other pairs, you train some encoder-decoder architecture. It means that you have some encoder that encodes your sentence to some hidden representation and then you have decoder that takes that hidden representation and decodes it to the target sentence. Now, the Nice thing is that if you just take your encoder, let's say for Japanese, and decoder for Korean, and you just tag them, somehow it works nicely, even though the system has never seen Japanese to Korean translations. You see, so this is zero shot translation. You have never seen Japanese to Korean, but just by building 
nice encoder and nice decoder, you can stack them and get this, this path. So it seems like this hidden representation that you have is kind of universal for any language pair. Well, it is not completely true, but at least it is very promising result.